Well, good morning. Shabbat shalom. Just want to uh, just uh, name a couple of people. I'm very appreciative of my son and daughter, uh, Kyle and Tash, being here this morning, pastoring a church down on the Gold Coast. It's lovely for you to be here. The beautiful Hadass, who's helping me today. Do you want to just stand up, Hadass, and just stand up? You have to do what I say because <laughs> we call her Wonder Woman for the amazing work she does. Uh, in the organisation of Kirin Hayasol UIA. I want to also especially thank uh, Peter and Sandy for the courage to continue uh, with the month that you've had. But the Lord knows, and uh, we've been encouraging each other actually this last week, week and a half. Um, you know, when the trials come, we've just got to dig in and keep moving forward with the Lord. Um, to my fellow speakers, Craig and Patrick and Joan, it's lovely to have you here. To all of you here, I saw Ian Warby here as well today from Christians for Israel, lovely to have you here. Today, uh, I do have two sessions and I just want to start by telling a little bit of a story about how I got involved with, uh, with Israel. Really, we were pastoring a church on the Gold Coast called King's. It's a fairly big church with schools and and. We were very focused on our congregation and the we're expanding, of buying up more uh, property and growing the schools and uh, our congregation was growing and really uh, the, the work that we're currently involved with was not even slightly or remotely on our radar. In 2015 we were running a festival called Kingdom Festival on the Gold Coast and the Lord spoke very deeply to my heart and said, I want you to take up an offering for Israel. And so I put it to my elders and I said, uh, how, do you, how, do you, how do you take up an offering for Israel? Who do you give it to? You know, what do we do? And so we just decided, let's just do it. We took up an offering and uh, then I had to uh, figure out who, who do I give the, like, do I just write a check to the Israeli government? It wasn't for a particular ministry. It was, it was for the nation of Israel. And I think we raised about, I don't know, about $12,000 in that offering. And I decided uh, earlier in the year, I had felt the Lord say that someone would buy me a ticket to Israel in October. And on the, the, the second day of our conference, a, a man came up and he said, Pastor Greg, could I please uh, have a talk to you? My wife and I agreed last night that we would like to pay for a ticket for you to Israel. And I looked at my watch and it was the 1st of October. So I'd already booked my month out, but I cancelled the end of my month and I booked a ticket to Israel and I learned from one of our guest speakers who I should give the cheque to, which was the, the ministry, the, the Israeli Ministry of uh, Aliyah and Immigrant Absorption, which is right in the centre there in Jerusalem. And so I took the cheque when I arrived in, in Israel, I took the cheque to the Ministry of Aliyah and Immigrant Absorption and no one spoke English. I found a French girl who was making Aliyah, which means returning to Israel, and she could speak Hebrew and English, and so we managed to get past the what I'm here for, and I said, I've got some money to give you, and suddenly I was ushered through into the, the, the office of the head of the, the Ministry of uh, Aliyah and Immigrant Absorption. But when I tried to give the money to them, they wouldn't accept it because you're not allowed to give a direct private donation to the government of Israel. So I said, what should I do now? I rang my friend in Dallas, in Texas, and said, you told me to give it here, but what should I do? He said, give me a few minutes. And the next thing, I had a phone call from a guy named Josh Reinstein, who said, can we meet up? Uh, I'd like to introduce you to the world chairman of Karen Hayasod, which was Moody Sandberg at the time. I said, I'd love to. When can we do it? It's going to be th Thursday. I'd hired a car. I went driving around Israel and uh, came back uh, for those meetings, but not before I visited a friend of mine, Peter Tukahira, in Mount Carmel, and we were standing there overlooking the Jezreel Valley where the Battle of Armageddon, it says, is going to be fought in the book of Revelation, and uh, as I'm standing there, he pulls me aside and he says, Greg, I have to prophesy over you. I have a word from the Lord. So I got on my knees and he, for those who, who's been to that big deck that oversees, you know, the, the little monastery there, 
he prayed over me and he said, your life's about to change. Uh, you're going to be very much involved in the nation of Israel. And you're going to be in some key roles in regarding that in Australia. I, I said, Peter, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> that just blanks it. You know, that, I didn't say it. It just cannot be from God. Anyway, I travelled back to Jerusalem and I went to meet another man named Tom Hess. And Tom's over on Bethphage, over in, on the Mount of Olives. And I spent about an hour with Tom and at the end of that meeting, Tom said, can I pray for you? God's got a word for you. So I got on my knees and he put his hand on my head and he said, God said, you're going to be involved in Israel. And the Lord says, you're going to be involved in key works in Australia for Israel. And I said, thank you, Tom. This still means nothing to me, but, you know, uh, this is the, the second time this has happened to me. I went then to my next appointment, which was in the city of David, to a beautiful couple there, the Gears, and I was having biscuits and tea with Una Gear on her veranda in the city of David overlooking the Mount of Olives and their aspects sort of southeast. And as we're having tea and bickies and talking about the Lord... Uh, she says, Greg, can you just wait here? She said, the Lord is speaking to me. And she disappears inside and she comes out and she had a big key. She said, this is the key of David. I've had it in a bottle of perfume and a prayer cloth. So I got on my knees and she put us both and she got on her knees under this prayer cloth and she gave me a key in my hand. And she said, the Lord said, you're going to be involved <laughs> in Israel. And you're going to be involved in some key works in, in Australia. It's not exactly the words they all said. I won't say the words they all said. But anyway, by that stage, I thought, what on earth is everybody talking about? And at that moment, while we we're on our knees under this prayer cloth, a lady came into the house on the veranda and lift, bold, eh? lifted up the prayer cloth while two people are praying and said, are you Pastor Greg from Kings on the Gold Coast? <laughs> now, had it been in Rabina in the Gold Coast, fair enough, but this was the city of David in Jerusalem under a prayer cloth with a key in my hand. And I said, yes, I am. She said, excellent. Can I talk to you afterwards? And then she hopped under the prayer cloth with me. So there was a lady I've come, become very fond of named Joy Helen. From that moment, my next appointment was at the town, the, the Crown Plaza in Jerusalem, just opposite the Knesset. And there I met Josh Reinstein and um, Moody Sandberg and handed my cheque over, <laughs> you know, for 12000 uh, But not before. I said, well, what sort of gifts do you receive, private donations at the minister, you know, uh, Kieran Hayes, so he said, oh, look, our biggest one's about 30 million. And I quickly put my check inside, you know, turned it over on the table. But he said, any amount of money is uh, wonderful for us. And we are really, since Moody became the chairman, are trying to create relations with Christians around the world in the work of, you know, bringing Jewish people back to the land of Israel. And so that was my immersing into to the calling that, uh, that I'm currently walking in because not long after that we um, uh, gave up our position, we resigned our position at King's and uh, within just a few months, Fraser Harding, actually a good friend, already had said, would you take over the Ministry of Good News for Israel? And so uh, it wasn't really a hard decision. I said that would be my delight and honour and so we took on that ministry. As part of that, we've been developing a, our website and our mission, and we've got some vision, some very clear things that we would love to, to accomplish, and we feel that by uh, the, the guidance of the Lord, that's what we're doing. But when it came to, and obviously one of those is, is supporting uh, Kieran Hayasad, the UIA program to bring the Jewish people back to Israel. I'll talk about that as part of my message this morning. This is just the preamble, and this part's free. So the... The website, when it came to the part of our website, is to 
is to work with the Jewish people to, to talk about Yeshua of Nazareth as the Messiah. I thought to myself, I'm going to just write a small treatise on this and present it on our website as a, a, bo- a broad catch-all, you know, a bit of a, an, an argument for the case of Yeshua the Messiah. And as I began that treatise, I realised this is not a two-week job because when I began to do it, I realised I was quoting New Testament scriptures. And I realised that when we're talking about the Jewish community, the New Testament is not necessarily considered part of the scriptures as it is for Christians. And so then I gave myself a massive challenge and that was to prove from the Tanakh that Yeshua should be considered seriously as the Messiah. And so I began to immerse myself into the the Midrash, the mission of the Talmud, the writings, the rabbinical writings and the Tanakh and decided that this work would be used only in the Old Testament, the Tanakh and the rabbinical writings to show that there is a very strong case from the Old Testament that Yeshua is the Messiah. Now, 550 pages later, I'm about a quarter of the way through this uh, because the, the argument is strong. And I want to talk a little bit about that today because what is the criteria of the Messiah? Who is the Messiah? Do Jewish people really, are they expectant of a Messiah? And the answer, of course, to that question, the last one, is yes. In fact, in my readings, I found out that, you know, reading um, Moses ben Maimon, Maimonides, who is one of the great rabbis in the, in the Mishnah and in his commentaries on, on the Scripture, writes in his 13 Principles of Faith, Principle 12 is, I believe with perfect faith that the Messiah is coming, and though he tarry, I will wait daily for his coming. And this is echoed through the writings, by the way. Uh, and why would that surprise us? Because, you know, the Messiah is the hope of Israel. The Messiah is the hope of the Jewish people. And so I, uh, I began to, to really research it and research the criteria. And I was quite surprised to find how many criteria there are in the Scriptures regarding the Messiah. And that if Jesus was to be the Messiah, if He were the Messiah, He must fulfil... How many of them do you think He must fulfil? He must fulfil all of them. So this is not an easy thing to do. Now, just, I just want to let you know that I'm not the Messiah. Okay, In case any of you th- were thinking that, I'm not the Messiah. Christians believe that Jesus is coming. My last name is coming. Some of you may have thought he's the Messiah. (laughs) He fulfills one of the criteria. But no, I want to assure you I'm not. And, And, you know, as Christians, we believe in the second coming. My son, my eldest son, he's not the Messiah either. Because he's the second coming. <laughs> and nor are the, any of the other comings because even though that's a fairly strong argument, not, you know, it's not, I'm just, that was a joke, but it's not a strong argument. There are a lot of criteria that we don't fulfil. So let's just have a look at some of the criteria of the Messiah that I have uncovered. I'm not going to read all of them. You can buy this. 4,000 page book when it comes out in about six years time. (laughs) But today, let's just look at some of the criteria of the Messiah that comes from the Tanakh, from the Old Testament. So the first criteria that's in in the Scripture is that Messiah must be 
a human being. Now, that's the very first criteria because it says in the book of Genesis, though not all Jewish people accept this particular scripture as a messianic scripture, in Genesis 3.15 it says, And I will put enmity, this is the Lord speaking uh, to the serpent after he had tempted Adam and Eve. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And secondly, the Messiah will be a man. So we're not looking for a female hero like Captain Marvel. We're not looking even for Wonder Woman, even though Gal Gadot is a Jewish lady. She's not the Messiah. It's going to be a human being who is also a man. Do you see how the criteria work? We find them in the Scripture and then we, we, what we're going to do is we're going to put Jesus against the criteria. Why, why would we do this? Because, dear friend, the Jewish people don't accept the New Testament as proof that Jesus is the Messiah. So what we're doing is we're going to give a proper treatise on this. And of course it's been done before, but uh, I'm really going into, into depths on this. So let's look at some of the other Interesting criteria of the Messiah. He, of course, will be a descendant of Eve, but he'll also be a descendant of Seth, Shem, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Ruth, Jesse, King David, Solomon, Zerubbabel. He will be, according to Isaiah 7.14, although this one is not accepted by many Jewish people, that a born of a virgin and be called Emmanuel. Although there's plenty of Jewish scholars that believe that is reference, referencing the Messiah. He will come out of Bethlehem. He will be called out of Egypt. He will be a prophet. He will be immersed in the Torah and its commandments as David was. Messiah will completely obey and follow the Torah. He will perform signs and wonders. He will have God's spirit and glory on him. An outpouring of the spirit will occur when he comes. The scripture talks of two messiahs. Two types of messiahs. Messiah ben David, who is the victorious king, and Messiah ben Joseph, the suffering servant. And it is well accepted by the sages that Messiah ben David will come when Israel repents as a nation. But if it is not ready, then Messiah ben Joseph will come and suffer and die. If it is required that Messiah ben Joseph comes, in other words, if Israel has not repented, then he will be seen coming lowly and riding on the foal of a donkey. He will be the rejected cornerstone. Remember, I'm quoting from the Tanakh. He will be struck and shamed. He will be killed for the sin of Israel. His grave will be with the wicked and with the rich. He will suffer his soul is an offering for sin. He will justify many and bear their iniquities. He will rise from the grave. That's Messiah ben Joseph. But when the time comes for uh, Israel to repent, then Messiah ben David, the victorious king, will come and he will be preceded by a time of great suffering called the pangs of pain. He will be involved in the war, uh, sorry, this will involve the war of Gog and Magog. Messiah's reign shall be preceded by fire and a sword. And then Elijah will precede him and announce him. The Messiah will come on the clouds. His robes will be dipped in blood. He will strike the earth and slay the wicked. He will deliver Israel from the hands of Esau. He will execute the heads of many countries and will judge the nations with a rod of iron. He will destroy Amalek and Moab. He will be the righteous judge of the nations and sit as a purifier and a refiner. He will cause all idols to be abolished. He will be greater than Moses. He will be greater than Abram and he will be higher than the angels. He is linked to the wisdom of creation. He will be called the Son of Man and the Son of God. 
He will be called Peretz, my king, my son, a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. He will be at the right hand of God and is God's anointed ruler. He will be called Yahweh Tzidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. He shall be called Yinan, Shiloh, the son of Joseph, the son of Ephraim and the son of David. There are other names that he'll be known by, but I won't go into those because I, I can't pronounce them. And I'll probably say something wrong, you know, like he'll be known as a lake or something like that. But that's, I just can't say those words. I'll get Had, Hadass to teach me those ones. When he comes, there will be a resurrection of the dead. God will give him an everlasting kingdom that will never end. He will be king over the whole earth, his dominion from sea to sea. He will be both priest and king. When he comes, he will come specifically to Zion and he will stand on the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 14. And he will establish and rule from Jerusalem from the final temple that he will build. The Messiah will return the children of Israel from their exile throughout the world and bring them back to the land of Israel. The Messiah will restore the Jewish people to the full observance of the Torah law. The Messiah will lead the world, the world in the study of the Lord. He will be the anointed, he'll be anointed king of Israel. He will rejoin Ephraim and Judah. He will purify the priesthood and the Levites. He will identify the tribes of Israel and accept those who are truly of Israel. He will provide atonement for his land and his people and bring repentance to all Israel who mourn and then will be saved. He shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Jerusalem will be built and inhabited and the cities of Judah will be built. He will dry up the Nile River, the Red Sea and make a highway from Egypt to Assyria. He will be a covenant, a light, a banner and salvation to the nations, including Australia. He will be sought by the Gentiles and bring justice to the nations the nations will offer him gifts and claim to belong to him. He will bring rejoicing among the Gentiles. He will restore the house of prayer for all nations. He will perfect the entire world and bring all men to serve God in unity. He will bring the knowledge of God to the whole world and proclaim God's name. He will bring peace to the whole world and end all war. There will be plentiful harvests on the mountains of Israel and economic progress. People will eat and be blessed. Under his rule, there will be no hunger. He will bring an end to sorrow and misery. The sun and the moon will shine brightly. And in his kingdom, animals will be herbivores and humans will be safe from wild animals. People will live to be great ages and speak a pure, clear language. These are just some of the the signs or the criteria of Messiah that you will find in your Old Testament, in your Tanakh. Yeah, let's give the Lord a, a great hand. So when Maimonides says, this is going to be our hope of the Jewish people, the coming of Messiah, it's not a light saying because the Jewish people have suffered terribly uh, through the, the multiple exiles that they've been involved with throughout the millennia. And the Messiah is the end of that forever for the Jewish people. But of all of those signs that I've just mentioned there, you know, being a human being, that's, that's not one of the big signs. That's, that's, that's a, sort of like an easy sign, you know. But of the biggest signs, I just want to talk about some of the biggest signs of the return, oh, sorry, of the, of the Messiah. And one that we must consider a sign of the coming of Messiah, or as Christians, the return of Messiah, is this great war that's going to start to take place before he returns. It's written by the sages. So many quotes in the, in the Talmud about the war of Gog and Magog. I didn't realise it played such a massive part of the expectancy of Messiah. But even as we speak, the four nations that are mentioned in Ezekiel 38 are already signing treaties uh, 
to put themselves in ports on the Mediterranean Sea, several, several ports, uh, on the Red Sea and on the uh, Arabian Gulf. That's already happening in our days. Uh, you just have to look at the news, really. Just if you start to get your filter aligned to what's happening, you will notice that these things are happening in our day and in our time. What does that mean? Well, it's a sign of the Messiah. This is one of the major signs of the Messiah. There is also the preceding of Messiah by Elijah is one of the great signs in the Scripture. But if I was to just take the next little while to talk to you about the biggest sign, the single biggest sign of the coming of the Messiah, it might surprise you. But Jeremiah tells us that this sign here eclipses every other sign. The biggest sign by far of the coming of Messiah is the return of the exiles from the four corners of the earth to the land that he promised Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. In the New Testament, Christians talk about the Antichrist and and some of the signs of the coming of Jesus. But I want to tell you by sheer volume of Scriptures that talk about and prophesy biblically, biblical prophecy about the return of the exiles, the Jewish people, God doing a miracle of miracles and extracting them from the four corners of the world and bringing them back to the promised land before He comes, or as Christians, before He comes again. This is the biggest sign by sheer weight of volume and by the words themselves. It says in Isaiah 62, 4, You shall no longer be termed forsaken. He's talking to the Jewish people. Nor shall your land anymore be termed desolate. But you shall be called Hephzibah. How's that right? Hephzibah? Hephzibah. Hephzibah. Is a Hephzibah. Hephzibah. And your land, Beula. Beula like virgin, Batula. Batula, virgin. For the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. Isaiah eleven twelve. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel. He will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from where? From the four corners of the earth. So there have been five returns to Israel. And and by this word is aliyah. It means to ascend. Specifically, it is meant as... Come back to Zion, back to ascend to Jerusalem. From wherever you are to come back, to, ri- to come up, ascend. Am I right there? Exactly. <laughs> In history, there have been five of these. Let's just talk about these quickly. Firstly, the exodus from Egypt. This is a massive miracle. Do you recall this story? It takes up such a big portion of Scripture. Out of this comes the the Torah. I'm talking about the Exodus. When God delivers the people, the children of Israel from there in slavery and bondage in Egypt and brings them over a period of 40 years into the land that He promised Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And He brings them back under Moses and He brings them in under Joshua. But along the way, they get the Torah, they get the, 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 the mitzvah, they get the... They get the festivals, the calendar, they get the sacrifice, they get everything along the way, the tabernacle. This is a massive miracle to transport some two, two and a half million people. There are 600,000 men who can fight. So maybe two, two and a half million people through in across the desert and then have a whole generation die and have that replaced by natural childbirth, and then bring them in to the promised land, having provided for them every single day for that period of time. This is monumental. How we even got them out of Israel is monumental with the 10 plagues. 
The introduction of Passover comes from this time. The introduction of Shavuot comes from this time. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. The festivals are all outlined by Moses in Leviticus 23. This is monumental. This is alia of an extreme kind. 2.5 million Jewish people over a long period of time back into the land. That's alia number one. Alia number two is when Shesh Bazaar, after the Babylonian captivity, brings back in 538 BC after Cyrus gives his declaration to send the Jewish people back to Israel after 70 years in captivity or exile. And a thousand people come back under Shesh Bazaar in 538. Number three in 516, Zerubbabel brings back 42,360 plus servants and handmaids, swelling the population of Jerusalem and Judea as the Jewish people start to make their way back into the land on the third Aliyah. The fourth Aliyah is Ezra's Aliyah, where 5,000 Jewish people uh, come with, with Ezra with an official approval of the Persian government. About 5,000 come back to the land. And then finally, Nehemiah's Aliyah, uh, we don't know the number of people that came back with Nehemiah, but you remember he's the wine, the wine bearer, the, the cup bearer for the, 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 the emperor, the king of Persia. And uh, he oversaw the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. Five major miracles. The biggest, of course, of course is the Exodus. And something really, really bad, bad happened. And it's no news for anyone sitting here that in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed by the Romans. And by 135 AD, after the Bar Kokhba revolt had been quenched, the Jewish people were sent ultimately into either slavery or into exile to the four corners of the earth for some nearly 1,800 years. 1850 years. I'm going to be speaking on my second time here a bit later about what's called Pillar 3, the international legal right for the Jewish people to the land of Israel. And I'm going to be presenting to you even the minutes of the War Cabinet meeting on the 31st of October 1917. So I'm not going there now. And I'm going to show you how God's hand has been on this. If anyone thinks this is just a coincidence. Jeremiah says that there will come an aliyah that will make the aliyah of Exodus like nothing. Jeremiah 16, 14. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that it shall no more be said. The Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. It shall no more be said. But the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north, from all the lands where He had driven them, for I will bring them back into their land which I gave to their fathers. This is the miracle that is the biggest criteria of the sign of the coming of the Messiah that when we begin to see a miracle that eclipses the miracle of the exodus from Moses, in sheer complexity, logistics and size, miracles, wonders, when we start to see that, we need to know the Messiah is coming. It is the biggest sign for Christians that Jesus is coming back. Jeremiah 31.10 says, Hear the word of the Lord, O nations. When it speaks of nations, it talks, Goyim. I've got my, I'm going to make sure she's my Hebrew teacher here. Goyim, Gentiles, non-Jews. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations. And declare it in the isles far off. And say, he who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. The Gentiles, particularly Christians, 
have a mandate from God to be involved in this great sign of the coming of Messiah. The Gentile Christians are to be practically involved. Isaiah 49, 22, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will lift my hand in an oath to the nations, Goim, and set up my standard for the peoples. They shall bring your your sons in their arms and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. At this sign, the Gentile Christians will turn again and honour the land and people of Israel and so honour the Lord. As Zephaniah 3.20 says, At that time I will bring you back even at the time I gather you, for I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I return your captives before your eyes, says the Lord. When the Jewish people start coming back to the nation of Israel, which has to be in existence before they can come back, by the way, which is part of this miracle. It's why it's such a complex and huge miracle. I'll cover how it happened when we talk about the land. We're talking about the people, always the people and the land. But when this starts to happen, the Gentiles, particularly Christians, are going to be shouting praise to God. This is monumental. This is huge. And God consistently says, so that they may know that I am the Lord. Jeremiah 33, 20, thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night so that there will not be day and night in this season, then my covenant may also be broken with David, my servant, so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne and with the Levites, the priests and my ministers, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered, nor the sand of the sea measured. So I will multiply the descendants of David, my servant, and the Levites who ministered to me. Thus says the Lord, if my covenant is not with day and night, and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, then I will cast away the descendants of Jacob and David, my servant, so that I will not take any of his descendants to be rulers over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for I will cause their captives to return and have mercy on them." There's a great link between the return of the Jewish people and the coming kingship, the millennial reign, the kingdom of God, uh, of the Messiah in this world, on this earth. And as a, a couple, just a couple more scriptures I really want to get out as my time comes to a close. Ezekiel 37, 9, he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds of breath and breathe on these slain that I may live. I always used to do this in prayer. I prophesy to the breath, you know, to the east. But this scripture is speaking about the return of the Jewish people to a land, to the bones that were set up, it's flesh on the bones. It says, then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I've opened your graves on my people and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I'll place place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and performed it. So this great last Aliyah is the great mighty sign of the coming of Messiah. And what does the Lord say? That we, those of us that are Christians, that believe in Jesus as the Messiah, are to be actively involved in this. To date, just to give you some idea, since the re-establishment of the state of Israel, the land of Israel, 3.6 million Jewish people have made Aliyah. 3.6 million. 3.6 million. Come on, let's give a hand. Let's give the hand to the Lord. That that is a wonderful miracle. My maths tell me that's more than 2.5 million. We are looking at a miracle that's bigger, as Jeremiah said. I have the great honour of being the, the chairman of Kiran Hayasad UIA, the Friends of Israel. The Friends of Israel are anybody who's a friend of Israel, but the larger number of the Friends of Israel are Christians around the world who have had a revelation that we have an opportunity, even an obligation in the sense of prophetic fulfilment, to be involved 
in the greatest miracle of the sign of the return of the Messiah. Why do we do what we do? Why do I do what I do? Because I believe, <laughs> I can't argue with three prophecies. I want to argue with two prophecies that I'll be involved in Israel. But three, the third one was pretty weird, you know, like a key on my knees in the city of David and had joy, Helen, and, you know, that was weird, strange. But no, it's a great door opening for me to be involved in the wonderful work of uh, sowing ourselves, putting our practical help into the return of the Lord. Like Daniel did when he knew the 70 years in Babylon were up, he began to fast and pray. He wasn't one of those that was responsible initially as a young teenager for Israel going into captivity. But when the time came and he prophetically saw that the captivity of Babylon was about to be finished, he got on his knees and began to do something and pray. So can I encourage you? We called this dinner the Enter the Story Dinner. Enter the Story. Enter the Story. How, people ask me, how do we enter in? How do we get into this? How do we become part of this? We well, enter the story. Why don't you, if you have a chance during the morning, tea or afternoon, there's no compulsion. What we're doing is opening up an opportunity. How do we get involved with that? And I know Ian's, Ian and the Christians for Israel have equal things going on in the ministry. But today, Hadass will be over there. If you want to be involved and at least come to the dinner, we've got speakers, we've got the, just confirmed yesterday, the ambassador of Israel is coming to our dinner. So why don't you uh, get involved in that? And uh, I look forward to talking to you in the next session about pillar number three. But let's just uh, close this session in prayer. Father, we thank you for your great miracle of the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel, a significant, huge criteria of Messiah. Lord, I thank you that you have given us the ability to enter into the things that you're doing these days. Many things we can be involved with, but thank you, Lord, that you're allowing us to be involved in these things. It's our great privilege, Lord, to worship you with our practical hands and feet, our resources, etc. Lord, we praise you and give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen.